tell us how did you ever get involved with pursuing King County in a legal suit? Okay, how did this start? Want the short version or the long version? Give me the long version. Okay, well, in a sense it began in 1995 when we were going through this business here in this area with the baseball stadium, with the, the controversy over whether we should spend public money subsidizing a new baseball stadium for the Mariners who were agitating to get out of the kingdom and have their own baseball stadium. and and it was ultimately voted upon by the public and it was voted down. And actually it was the second time it was voted down because there'd been a prior election where I think it was in with some other issue as well. But, but in any event, in 1995, toward the end of the summer or about September of 1995, we had an election specifically on that baseball stadium issue. I think it was during the primaries. And, and it was voted down and it was voted down very narrow, narrowly not 40, 49 to 51 or 49.9 or it was really really close and then shortly after that election uh, my wife and I and our two daughters the older of our daughters being nine years old at the time uh, went away on vacation to Europe we were gone for almost a month and we got back in early October and we were the first day we were back in our house, we had the TV news on and turned the news off when it was over and sat down to dinner and there was something on the news about the baseball stadium being built. And my not, then nine-year-old daughter, who's now 17, you know, was alert to that and, and over dinner brought up uh, sort of a mommy and daddy, I heard something on the news about a baseball, they were saying something about the baseball stadium being built, and wasn't there an election on that just before we left on this vacation? Wasn't that voted down? Why are they saying on television that there's going to be a baseball stadium? And I commented to her that, well, I noticed the same thing, and apparently something has happened while we've been gone. And I don't know what it is, but a couple of mornings hence, from that a couple of mornings later, I was going to be at a breakfast meeting at one of the local business uh, business people's breakfast meetings at uh, Pemco on East Lake Avenue, and Gary Locke, now the governor, then King County Executive, was going to be the speaker. And I said, I'll ask him at that uh, breakfast meeting. So maybe two mornings later, I went to this breakfast meeting and there were probably a hundred or more people there and Gary Locke was the speaker and he gave his usual speech about what's going on in King County and so on and then the question and answer period began and right away people were asking about this baseball stadium issue and by the nature of what they were saying in their questions I could tell something something had happened while I was gone and there were a lot of people really upset about how a a runaround or an end run, to use a sports metaphor, had been done because they had it had been voted down. And apparently, I mean, as we now know, the while we were gone on vacation, the legislature, state legislature, had been lobbied about this, and the state legislature had passed some sort of a bill that any county in the state with a population of one million or more, which is only King County, could by the authority of its county council authorize the issuance of bonds to build a sports stadium or a convention center. I think they covered a number of different possibilities. But anyway, basically there was a bill, uh, I, 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 hopefully I'm not exaggerating when I put it this, characterize it this way, a, a bill was passed by the legislature that sort of accommodated the apparent desire by certain politicians in King County to get this stadium without having to go to back to the people again who had just voted this thing down. And so there was a lot of anger about this and a lot of people were asking these questions. <clears throat> and I remember Gary Locke saying, well, you know, we had this election and this election was really, really close. Why? It was so close that if this election had been in a town of only 10,000 people, it would have been one vote 
difference between winning and losing. He drew some analogy uh, because it was this tenth of a percent margin or whatever. And then he went on to say, this, he made this stunning statement. He said, what this really, really close vote was telling us was that people wanted a stadium. They just didn't want to pay for it with the financing mechanism we had come up with. They wanted a stadium, but they wanted it paid for in a different way. And then he reviewed how the proposal had been, the proposal that had been voted down, was to increase the general sales tax by one-tenth of one percent. So I don't remember now what the sales tax then was. Maybe it was 8.2, it would go to 8.3, and, and that was what people had voted down. And he felt that the people were sending a message that they wanted a stadium, but they wanted a different financing mechanism. So he said, we, we came up with a different financing mechanism. We came up with a half percent increase in the sales tax on uh, food and beverage in any King County restaurant, tavern, or bar. We came up with a tax on rental cars. And he started talking about socking it to the tourists. You know, that in effect, this, this won't cost us anything, the people anything, the local citizens will we'll get it out of the tourists. So then some other people asked questions, but he just kept sort of on these vague generalities. And uh, people said, well, you know, why, why didn't we get to vote on that then? You know, and he never really answered the question. And finally, I stood up and said that, you know, we'd been out of town and related how my young daughter had seen this thing on television and the question she had asked and that I had told her, well, I'm going to be seeing Gary Locke in a couple of mornings and I'll ask him. So I said, on behalf of my nine-year-old, I'm going to ask you this, this same question. You know, why is it we voted this down? And he sort of reiterated what he had said before. And I said, well, but you know, and he made some comment, you know, your, your daughter is very bright and what you can go home and tell her is blah, blah, blah. So I said, well, I've got a follow-up question. You're right, my daughter is very bright and in fact in school right now, one of the things she's learning is the scientific method. And one of the things she's learned in the scientific method is the word assumption. And she's going to immediately recognize that, that you have made an assumption that this is what people wanted. They, they wanted it taxed in a different way. They wanted, a, they wanted the stadium, but they wanted to pay for it in a different way. And she knows that under the scientific method, you test your assumptions. And the way you would test this assumption to see if it's true is you have another vote. So since I don't expect to see you again anytime soon, I might as well ask you now the question that I'm sure my daughter is going to ask me tonight when I tell her what you just told me. Why, don't, why didn't we have another vote? He said, oh, well, you know, your daughter is obviously very bright and so on. And what you can tell her is that uh, <clears throat> the reason we didn't have, another, uh, didn't have another vote was there wasn't enough time because the baseball team was going to move. They were going to leave. And so that's why we didn't have another vote, that there wasn't time to have another vote. I said, oh, well, I'm sorry, I have to ask you another follow-up question. I said, you know, you don't know who I am, but I'm Armenian. And uh, my, my daughter is half Armenian, and Armenians are recognized to be among the best negotiators in the world. And my young daughter already knows something about negotiation. And she's going to say, but Dad, Mr. Locke fell for the, it sounds like he fell for the oldest negotiating trick in the book. And to use a sports metaphor, if you don't give me a new baseball stadium, I'm going to pick up my bat and ball and go somewhere else. You know, how does he know that wasn't a bluff? And this is a man that, you know, is supposed to know something about negotiating and he's a politician. It sounds like he fell for, you know, a, an old negotiating trick. And so then Gary Locke said, oh no, it, this wasn't a negotiation trick. They really were going to leave and, and so on. So anyway, that was the end of that. That was in 95. And baseball stadium, you know, went on to be built. And two years go by, and in 97, we start going through this all over again. Now it's the football team. No surprise, the baseball team got a stadium. So the football team says, well, we want a stadium too. And so then in, in 97, we're revisiting these same kinds of issues, and there, eventually we had this thing, Referendum 48, and it was to be on the ballot, and was on the ballot uh, at June 17th of 1997. 
and I was following the debate the same way I'd followed it with the baseball stadium, and you know, sort of back. Meanwhile, back at home, my then nine-year-old was now 11 years old, and you know, sort of the civics lesson that had begun in. 1995 about how do these decisions get made we've had an election but the, the legislature does this and then the county council does that and the different branches of government and so on the, the lesson sort of gets reprised and if that's the right term and so uh, I was following the debate and I was noticing how different politicians would be on talk shows debating the merits of Essentially, demolishing the kingdom and building this new football stadium, and the economic uh, justifications, whether there were economic justifications or there weren't. And I started hearing references by Ron Sims and others to a, a study that had been done, and occasionally it would be mentioned by the county, but there'd be references to a study or studies that said that the economic impact of the football team would be and sometimes the number six million dollars a year would be used and another time sixty million would be used and another time a hundred twenty million would be used and i'm thinking well are there three different studies with three different numbers which diverge so wildly is there one study and somehow people are picking different numbers from it w where is this number coming from and i wanted to see i wanted to see the study or studies that they were quoting from to sort of get it figured out for myself just exactly who is saying what and how could there be three different numbers that are so far apart. And so that ultimately led to my making a Public Disclosure Act request of Ron Sims in late May of 1997, approximately two and a half weeks before the election, to see the economic study or studies being mentioned by him and others. and knowing that it's possible to to preordain the results of a study depending on what consultant you pick and what you tell the consultant the consultant by way of specifications or assumptions to use for their study i included in my request that i see all related documents as to um, how and why and by whom these studies were ordered and the cost of the studies meaning I wanted to see any bidding documents as to how they selected the consultant, the, you know, the request for proposals or whatever, purchase orders ordering the studies, uh, invoices being billed for the studies, cancel checks, and um, well, that's it. That's how it started. What came of your requests? Oh, well, in a nutshell, four years of uh, stonewalling, runaround, idiotic, nonsensical, self-contradictory letters, letters from different people that would arrive within a day or two of one another saying they did have documents and another letter saying they didn't have documents and another letter saying they would provided everything they were going to and needed to. It was seven or eight months of just a, a ridiculous exchange of correspondence in which I saw very little and and was dealing with just a, a bunch of amateurs who four years later professed before the judge in court that they were incompetent that that for for seven months they they were guilty of mere bureaucratic incompetence, that they didn't understand what I was asking for, they didn't understand the plain English language of the letters, including ultimately from my first lawyer that I got involved in the case, who himself had about a six-month runaround period, on top of my seven-month runaround period, uh, letters that said, I would like to see purchase orders, invoices, and canceled checks by way of examples and didn't get any of those for four years during which time th their excuse ultimately was we didn't understand what he wanted we, in effect saying we didn't understand that when he asked for purchase orders invoices and canceled checks that he wanted to see purchase orders invoices and canceled checks because they had them now there is a wealth of information that you dug up 
from pursuing these documents and pursuing your case. But before we get to that, tell us about you are suing King County, is that correct? I'm suing the, the office of Ron Sims, the county executive, and King County. I think that's how it's worded in the lawsuit. And specifically, why are you suing uh, them? Well, the, the, the lawsuit began uh, as, a, as a suit to compel the production of documents that I believed existed and which turned out to, be, to exist and to recover the legal fees I incurred to, to bring that lawsuit and to get those documents produced. And it, it took a lawsuit to get them. It took, a, it took quite a lawsuit to get them because he, actually we filed the lawsuit in, or I filed the lawsuit in March of 2000 and nothing happened. The, the, the fact that I sued them did not cause any documents to be produced. In fact, it produced an answer from King County to the lawsuit in effect saying there are no documents. And then about uh, six, seven months later, we served King County with what are called interrogatories. These are questions that have to be answered under penalties of perjury and, re and, re and, it, and the process, uh, it's part of the process that in the legal world is called discovery. And they have to be responded to within 30 days, ordinarily. 30 days came and went, they asked for an extension, uh, but they told, the King County prosecuting attorneys told my attorneys, we, we want an extension, we can't answer these questions in 30 days, but in any event, we, we don't have any documents. You know, what we produced back in 97 is it, there is no more. So we gave them a couple of we a week or two extension, then they asked for another week or two extension, and finally we said no more extensions, produce the documents, and we got out to 75 days, and they still had not produced answers to these interrogatories, and we filed a, what's called a motion to compel. So my lawyers had to take the time to prepare this motion to compel and get in front of a judge. And it was around then, I don't remember the exact dates now off the top of my head, but it, we, I think we served those interrogatories in mid-November of 2001, and it was about mid-February of 2000, I'm sorry, we served the interrogatories in I think November of 2000. And it was about mid-February of 2001 that we had the motion to compel, and suddenly they started producing documents with an affidavit from one of their employees saying that they had suddenly become aware that these documents existed after all, after four years. And, so, and then those documents, it was an initial production of documents. I forget now, maybe 60 or 70 or 100 documents that for four years supposedly didn't exist and they'd spent hundreds of hours looking for them and couldn't find anything and we had all that there was. And when I started looking at those documents, I quickly realized by the nature of what they revealed that there were more documents. And so we then had a second motion to compel and then they started producing more documents. And this went on for several months, there were three or four or five distinct productions of documents, and each time they would say, that's all of them now. They're, I'm sorry we didn't produce, you, yes, you were right, w the last production wasn't complete, there were a few more, but this is it now. You've got everything now. And then we'd find evidence in those documents that there were yet more documents, and this would just repeat itself. And it's still going on, although the, the ultimately the judge said they don't have to produce anymore. So the original lawsuit was to get the documents and to get to recover my legal fees for what I had to go through to get them and penalties provided for under the Public Disclosure Act so that they would pay a penalty for having violated the law because otherwise there'd be no incentive for any agency to comply with the law in the future and if you if you had a public official who had control over the release of documents or their minions and there was some situation where the documents would be sufficiently 
incriminating or sufficiently embarrassing that they, they were, didn't want to release them, they could just not release them, claim incompetence, as King County did in this case, and take their chances that a citizen would sue and perhaps just recover their legal fees or less, which is what's happened to me. And so far, I've only recovered about half my legal fees. That's all that the judge ruled. And there'd be no incentive to comply with this law unless there were some penalties. Um, and, and even then, because these penalties don't come out of the politician's pocket, they come out of the public pocket, which, isn't, which is the way it is. But, um, Anyway, that's, that's what I sued for. Originally it was to get the documents, and then as, it, as I had to incur costs for legal fees and, and deposition transcripts and so on, I wanted to recover those costs as well, plus get penalties. At what point from the documents that you requested did you start seeing things that led you to believe that the stadiums were not what they were presented to the public as being, that the Seahawks stadium was... Uh, a farce, basically. Well, that's a very good question. Well, let's see here. We're sitting here with this, having this interview on October 9th, 2003. And I guess the, the there, are, there are hundreds of documents and thousands of pages. And I guess the picture started to form in the summer of 2000 and and one, as these documents came forward, that, and later, that ultimately I discovered there were about 20 different studies that had been done involving economic impacts of the baseball stadium, the football stadium, or the kingdom. And it took, it took a while to sort of absorb all this and to put things together in chronological order, and, and we realized they were missing pieces. And, but it started looking like, gee, it was almost as though any time a study was commissioned and it didn't say what somebody wanted said, they would go and commission another study and spend some more public money until they, until they got a consultant to say what they wanted, which was that ultimately that the kingdom is gonna cost a tremendous amount of money to, um, to renovate and you might as well demolish it and build a new stadium. And these studies were, were not inexpensive. They, the cheapest of the studies would be around $50,000. There was one study that cost $1,155,000. Uh, the second most expensive study was around $250,000, dollars But anyway, the picture started to emerge in 2001, but again, it, when the judge brought down her ruling in September of 2001. She said, I wouldn't get any more documents. We were certain that there were more documents. And in early 2002, about March of 2002, a, another person sympathetic to my situation did a PDA request, Public Disclosure Act request of their own f for the very documents that I believed existed that the judge had said had not ruled to be produced. So this other person in March of 2002 did a Public Disclosure Act request of King County asking for the very documents I had not yet received and believed existed and kind of got a little bit of a run around for a few months but ultimately in around June or July of 2002 got a letter saying we don't think we have what you're asking for but we've located several boxes of documents and maybe they've got something you'll find of interest and you're welcome to come down and take a look. So I went with that person and we discovered in the, those boxes some of the very documents that we had asked the judge to order King County to produce a year earlier and that King County had said did not exist and that the judge did not order to be produced and, and we found those documents. And they, they filled in a lot of the missing pieces. And so then the picture started to emerge that it, it seemed like there was a reasonably orchestrated, with some bumbling and fumbling on the part of the bureaucrats, a reasonably orchestrated plan to 
get some consultants to write some studies that would say what they wanted said, which was that a new football stadium will produce some economically justifiable uh, economic activity for the region and that the kingdom will cost more money to renovate than, than it's worth spending. And one of the things we found, and Rick Anderson of the Seattle Weekly has written about this, and there's a particularly lengthy and detailed article in the mid-February issue of the Seattle Weekly about this, which is available at seattleweekly.com at their archives, <coughs> we found that there was one consultant in particular who had done a very exhaustive study over about a year and a half period of time that came to a conclusion in March of 96, 15 months before the election over the football stadium, a study that cost $1,155,000 that said that a, a, a complete renovation of the kingdom, making it into, you know, pretty much a state of the, bringing it up to modern standards in terms of competitiveness and so on, would have cost about $200 million. And, and about the same time as that study was finished up in March of 96, we found an internal document between then King County Executive Gary Locke, uh, now governor, and one of his assistants saying to Gary Locke that this study had come to this conclusion, it was recommended that he accept this conclusion of, the, of spending $200 million, but that $200, we, there was not a need to spend $200 million of public money, or excuse me, the, to, to rephrase that, it, would, it, it did not necessarily require $200 million of public money to accomplish this $200 million renovation, which included seismic upgrades about which there's some question whether those were even needed, but it, still it included even those things. And this, this communication from Gary Locke's assistant to Gary Locke then recited how the Bearings, the then owners of the Seahawks football team, were willing to put up $45 million of that $200 million. And there were some other contributions available from some, from some other sources, so that the total public funds contribution would be around 106 to $110 million. And for that, the kingdom could have been renovated. The football team that was otherwise threatening to break its lease would have stayed and executed a new lease. And many complaints that were, we found other documents that indicate that these were legitimate complaints by many other tenants of the kingdom would have been taken care of with this renovation. Because there were, there are lots of people, uh, home shows and large public assembly events, Billy Graham crusades, just lots of different public gatherings that use the kingdom for events that had complaints about the condition of the kingdom. So it was gonna solve all these problems. So for approximately 106 to $110 million of public money, the kingdom could have been saved. There would have been uh, no need to build a new football stadium, and indeed the, the owners of the football team would, were not agitating necessarily for, for a new football stadium. They were agitating for the kingdom being fixed up. And as I say, we have found internal documents, well, I guess this would be also be a part of the answer to your question, indicating these internal documents indicating that since 1988, going back uh, eight prior years and prior King County executive administrations, King County was on notice that there were legitimate complaints about the condition of the kingdom and that there were repairs that were needed and, and made sense and had been promised by King County to the tenants and the promises had not been kept. And, at, and we're talking maybe eight, 10, 12 million dollars in improvements, not you know, that, that order of magnitude, not 100 million or 400 million. Not, you know, looking back, not a lot of money. In any event, so in March of 96, we saw that th that was the state of affairs, that the kingdom could have been completely renovated uh, pursuant to a study done by a firm that was paid a million one hundred and fifty five thousand dollars to come to this conclusion and it appears and then there's there's a gap now for three months then between March and June of 96 where there's 
there are no documents, and there had to have been some documents, because next thing you know, three months later, that recommendation not having been taken, the very same firm that had just said 200 million to renovate the kingdom, but it would end up being about 110 million of public money, the very same firm is rehired at a cost of about another 250,000 to do another study, having just done a study, is recommissioned to do a new study, and six months later in December of 96, the same firm says it will cost 400 million to renovate the kingdom. They went from 200 million to 400 million. And the public portion goes from 100 million to 300 million. So, I don't know how much more you'd like me to say, but maybe I've answered your last question. It, it, these are the kinds of very curious things that we've been discovering. That it just seems like there was an agenda and they weren't gonna let facts get in the way. And if they needed to do another study, uh, they'd, they'd do another study. And it's just absolutely amazing that they got the same firm that had just said it would cost 200 million to renovate the kingdom to, to nine months later say it would cost 400 million. What was the public justification at the time for coming up with the second study, or was there any public questioning of coming up with the second study? Well, another very good question, and this is where we get into the missing documents. Because th this second study was commissioned, HOK2 was commissioned about June of 96. And it's, it's unclear because, again, there, there must be some documents that we don't have. It's unclear why this second study was ordered. What, what is reasonably clear from those documents that we have is that it was done for something called the Kingdom Renovation Task Force, which was a, an entity that was created, one of these blue ribbon task force kind of things that was created by Gary Locke about uh, either December of 1995 or January of 96, when all this controversy was going on, what do we do about the kingdom and the football team is threatening to leave and there was, they'd hired an out, King County had hired an outside law firm at a reported cost of around mil a million dollars in legal fees to give them advice on what to do with the bearings and this was the time period when the Bearings left, actually packed up and moved to Los Angeles in the middle of the night, and then they ended up coming back and so on. So in, in the midst of all this, Gary Locke created this thing called the Kingdom Renovation Task Force, and it began meeting in January of 96 and met for 12 months. We have documents that say that it met twice a month for 12 months, between January of 96 and December, that there were 24 meetings, but there are no minutes of these meetings. We've asked for the minutes, that was part of the court proceedings, and King County has steadfastly denied that they've got any documents or that there were any minutes kept of the meetings. Now, we have found some correspondence by Peter von Reichbauer who was then and still is a King County Council member who was on this King Dome Renovation Task Force but apparently didn't attend all of, the minute, all of the meetings. But we did find a letter, and this is one of the odd documents here and there that we found. We found a letter from Peter von Reichbauer dated, I think it was in May of 96, to the co-chairs of the King Dome Renovation Task Force which would be, and I'm just going by memory here now in response to your question, Mike. The two co-chairs were Wes Ullman, a former Seattle mayor, and uh, Pat Patrick. I believe that was his name. S mentioning that he'd been at a recent meeting, that he would try to attend meetings in the future but wasn't sure if he'd be able to. If he didn't attend meetings, he would try to send one of his staff. But then going on to make the observation that he noticed that there weren't a whole lot of people at this meeting. And the Kingdom Renovation Task Force, I think, had something like 32 or 36 members. And I gathered 
there weren't a whole lot of them at this meeting. And this was of concern to King County Council Member Von Reichbauer. And he said that, he, he made this observation that he didn't see there were very many people there. And he wondered if they were taking attend, <clears throat> he wondered if they were taking attendance. And he requested that attendance be taken from then on. And that if there was a pattern of low attendance, that each member of this task force be individually contacted reminded of their responsibility to attend these meetings, get a commitment from them to attend the meetings, or get their resignation and get somebody else on there who will attend the meetings because this is very important. So if nothing else, that document suggests that they should have been keeping attendance records. And normally, those are the kinds of things that are in the minutes of meetings. Who was there? who had an excused absence, who left early perhaps. And so we have asked for these documents. Minutes of meetings, attendance, no, we've been told nothing. It's hard to believe, especially given that we have found minutes of many other meetings of many other organizations or committees that existed during the same time period that had to do with the kingdom that might have only had seven people on them and that were not making decisions uh, of the level of four hundred million dollars in magnitude that did keep you know very uh, fastidious if that's a good word to use minutes you know starting and ending times and who was there and who took the minutes and so on so it's very odd that a kingdom renovation task force specifically created to deal with the issue of what to do with the kingdom would not have had minutes of its meetings but anyway what we found or what i found in the minutes <clears throat> of the meetings of another group that had this may start getting a little confusing but there was another group that had something to do with the kingdom and one of the people who was at one of the meetings of that other group would report to that group about what was going on at the meetings of the Kingdom Renovation Task Force whose meetings he also attended. And in the minutes of this, of the, in the minutes of the meeting of this other group, this individual reported that at a, at the then most recent meeting of the Kingdom Renovation Task Force, there had been discussion about this HOK-1 report and that one of Paul Allen's people was at the meeting and that Paul Allen was not happy with the results of HOK-1 and he wanted another study done. And so it's little bits here and there that we've picked up in other documents that indicate that this Kingdom Renovation Task Force was the place where apparently they discussed HOK-1. Paul Allen didn't like the results of it, wanted another study. So the next thing you know, there's another study. Now, another odd document we found was a letter dated in June of 96 from, I believe it was the then director of the kingdom. His name was Vern. Uh, Wagner, I believe it was. He's since passed away. To the, uh, I'm not sure whom it was to, it was a, at a high level within King County, saying that the Kingdom Renovation Task Force needed to have a study done. And, and this sounds like it was HOK too. They needed to have a study done to determine what to do with the Kingdom. And and this study was going to cost $240,000. No indication of where the $240,000 number came from. And that, that's another missing piece. We know that th there have to be some documents, some proposals from the consultant mentioning, coming up with the, the $240,000 amount. But in any event, there was this letter and it said the Kingdom Renovation Task Force needs to do a study to aid it in the accomplishment of its work. This study is going to cost $240,000. And it then went on to sort of say that, but the Kingdom Innovation Task Force doesn't have $240,000 to, 
to, to, to, to work with. And <clears throat> then it went on to say that Paul Allen, and there, these were very curious words, Paul Allen has a parallel interest in seeing such a study done. That's a very odd word, phrase to use, parallel interest. You would think, if anything, Paul Allen might have a conflict of interest. But anyway, he has a parallel interest in seeing such a study done and is willing to pay $150,000 of the cost of the study contingent upon the study being done by HOK, which is who ended up doing the study. And, and now this is again HOK that had just completed a study for, and had been paid $1,155,000 and said that the kingdom could be renovated and they recommended the renovation for $200 million and then there was the internal memo saying from Gary Locke's assistant Gary Locke saying the bearings will put up 45 million of it and there are some other sources of funds and so it would end up being 106 to 110 million of public funds. So this, uh, anyway, there was this memo saying we need approval for the rest of the 240,000 but basically saying we have the opportunity to get a study done for 240,000 Paul Allen will pay 150000 of, of it. Without his contribution, there's no way we could afford to do this study. We need this study, and, and we're asking for the other 90000 And oh, by the way, we need this study done really quickly, and there's no time for competitive bidding. So we'd like, to wait. we'd like a waiver from the competitive bidding rules. And there's also no time to go through what they called... Um, uh, uh, MIMBY or um, WIMBY, the, the Women and Minority Owned Business Enterprise uh, Allocation Agreements, where you agree that whenever there's a project m involving more than a certain amount of money, some percentage of that activity will go to either women owned or minority owned business enterprises. WIMBY, I think it's called, is the acronym in King County. And, and so, by the way, this thing needs to be done so quickly, we don't have time to go through the WIMBY uh, stuff, so we'd like a waiver from having to comply with those rules. And we just want to go ahead and, and have this HOK firm do it. And so, there's some, several very interesting things in here. Uh, Paul Allen has a parallel interest. He, he will help pay for this study. He was going to pay 62.5% of it. But only if this firm did the work. And then we found another letter between one of Paul Allen's people and one of the Kingdom's people. And it was um, Bill Witsit of Football Northwest, which is, was the Paul Allen organization, and a, uh, and a, a former King County pros assistant prosecuting attorney named James Kelly. Uh, yeah, James, I don't think it's John, I think it's James Kelly, who was the King County liaison to the Kingdom. I know I'm mentioning a lot of names here. I hope the viewers can follow all this. And, and that was a, a curious letter dated in June of 96 from Jim Whitsitt of Paul Allen's organization saying to James Kelly, this is to confirm that King County will hire HOK to do a study to analyze the kingdom and that, um, and that you will use and he referred to an attachment, which I didn't get from King County, didn't get for a year, and, and only through the efforts of this other person. But he referred to an attachment, and it says, you will use, it is agreed, or whatever, that you will use the attached NFL Stadium Facility Guidelines document as the blueprint for the desired final product. The blueprint for the desired final product. Again, very curious language. And then it, it also went on, this letter went, went on to specify who would be the economic analysis subconsultant that HOK would use. So this is why I say th this study appears to me to be rigged. They, Paul Allen basically dictated the choice of consultants and it was the same consultant who had just said it would cost 200 million to renovate the kingdom that ended up saying it cost 400 million. They provided the specifications, and when we later saw that, that document that, that had its own set of oddities and curiosities associated with it. And so, um, I forget what your original question was, Mike, but I mean, 
it just seems like it seems very very odd that that this study was apparently ordered for the Kingdom Renovation Task Force but there we don't have any meeting minutes of that entity that organization the claim is that there aren't any it's hard to believe Peter von Reichbauer asked that organization to at least keep attendance records you would think that as early as May of 96, if they didn't keep attendance records, he would have shown up at another meeting, or his staff did, and would have said, hey, where are those attendance meet, uh, uh, records you're supposed to be keeping? It's hard to believe that other entities meeting around that time that had anything to do with this matter were keeping minutes of meetings. Organizations generally keep minutes of meetings. And so, uh, it's just through these anecdotal records that it appears the ordering of HOK was done by the Kingdom Renovation Task Force, but for most practical intents and purposes, it was ordered by Paul Allen and given to them because he specified the consultant, he paid most of the cost. Tell us about the NFL guidelines document that you uncovered. Okay, that's a really, that's a really interesting and we feel a smoking gun document. First of all, um, we didn't, I didn't lay my eyes on that document until about a year after the King County Superior Court trial and the denials by King County that, that they had this document. Again, it was an attachment to the two-page letter dated in June of 96 between uh, uh, Jim Whitsett and James uh, of uh, Paul Allen's organization and James Kelly of the Kingdom. So the letter referred to the attached NFL Stadium facility guidelines as the blueprint for the desired final product. So King County said they didn't have this document and Mr. Yusufian was just getting carried away with asking for more and more. So it was about a year later in the summer of 2002 that I accompanied this other individual who long after my Superior Court trial, did a P Public Disclosure Act request of his own for uh, that document, specifically that document, among others. But he said, I want to see, you know, I'm, I, he sent King County a letter and said, I'm attaching a two-page letter dated June of 96 between Jim Woods and James Kelly, and this letter refers to an attachment. I want to see that attachment. And he got letters back saying they didn't have it and eventually a letter saying, we've, we've found some boxes, they, we don't think they contain what you've been asking for, but you might find them of interest and you're welcome to come down and take a look. So I went with him and lo and behold, in that box was the document, was this 12 page thing. And um, pardon me, he, he may eventually have gotten it in the mail. And, uh, and what we noticed about it was when he, he got a copy of it, it was a photocopy of a document that had, had apparently come to King County via fax back in 1996. And it had fax markings on it, indicating it had come from a phone number uh, on the east side, uh, by, for the viewer, you know, the east side of Lake Washington the Bellevue area because it, it had a 425 area code or it was a, it was a Bellevue phone number. I, I can't remember when we got all those extra area codes now, but one way or another, I'm just going by memory, we could tell it had come from Bellevue and then it, it had some initials for the office it had come from. And the initial, initials were FNW as in Football Northwest. And we thought, why does this document why was it faxed to King County from Football Northwest? And anyway, that seems sort of odd. Well, then, then when we went down to King County and, and in the summer of 2002 and went through boxes of documents, we found some additional copies of this document and they didn't have those fax markings on them. So we then knew they had more than one copy of this document that they had taken so long to produce and had said up to the prior summer, they didn't have it all. They had it in more than one version. And so uh, when we started looking at this document, 
it said it said NFL stadium facility guidelines and NFL presumably stands for National Football League and the first thing that struck me was well if, if this is a National Football League document laying out their guidelines for what, what this purported to be were the the sort of the architectural requirements and seating capacity requirements and sight line specifications and heights of seats above the seat before it so people could look over other people's heads and so on. If, if this was supposedly the National Football League's guidelines say to an architectural firm, this is, these are the guidelines you have to follow when you're designing a stadium for a National Football League affiliate team to play in, you would think it would be on National Football League letterhead. And I'm sitting there thinking, I assume National Football League has letterhead. They've got an office somewhere. They probably got letterhead. And this was not on any letterhead. And then it had, it had very curious comments in there about the width of corridors and things that would be governed by a local community's building code and fire codes and life safety codes. It, it just seemed very odd. And then I started showing it to some lawyers. And right away, because lawyers think in a certain way, the, the reaction uniformly within 30 seconds of reading the first page would be they said, this is not from the National Football League. I'd say, why, because it's not on letterhead? Well, never mind that. This is not the sort of thing a National Football League would dictate. It's, this is some sort of a contrived document. And I said, well, that, that was sort of the feeling I was getting. But, you know, sort of, but how do we prove that? I mean, that, that was our reaction. Well, then we continued going through this box, and we found, and again, Rick Anderson has written about some of these things, we found a memo dated, as I recall, around November of 1996 from somebody inside King County to somebody else inside King County saying, and, and, and just to put things in perspective now, between about June of 96 and December of 96, during the six month period, this second HOK study was being done, HOK2, based on this 12 page attachment, the NFL Stadium Facility Guidelines. So. HOK was doing this work to figure out what will it cost to renovate the kingdom to comply with these guidelines and it ended up being $400 million. And what will it cost to build a new stadium that will comply with these guidelines? It was around the same $400 million and so it was then became you might as well get a whole new stadium and it'll seat more people versus renovating the kingdom which could not have been renovated to one of the um, requirements in this 12 page document was that you had to have 72,000 seats, which it turns out is not an NFL requirement at all. But the kingdom could not have been renovated to quite 72,000 seats. The most you could squeeze out of it was somewhere around uh, 65, 66,000, maybe 67,000 seats. And Paul Allen was agitating for 72,000 seats. Although interestingly enough, eventually when the football stadium opened, the new football stadium, it was with 67,000 seats. But anyway, uh, Around November of 96, five months into this HOK2 study, we found that there was an internal memo by somebody in King County who said, I have just become aware that the NFL Stadium Facility Guideline document we've been working with did not come from the National Football League, has not, and basically went on to say, and it has nothing to do with the National Football League. It not, has not been blessed by them or authorized by them or whatever. In fact, it came from Paul Allen. And when we saw that, we said, oh, our, our instincts were right. This, this was a contrived document, and they knew it. And yet, we found documents in the days and weeks and up to a year following by people who would have known of that memo, continuing to refer to it as the NFL stadium requirements. It's the, it's the they, didn't, they didn't want to hear this. They didn't want, it was as though everybody understood they were playing a game. This document 
had been created by Paul Allen's people, but labeled the way that it was, and they were all going to just go along and pretend, although they really knew better, that this actually came from the National Football League. And wasn't it being portrayed in the press at that time as well as being something from the National Football League? That's my recollection, that in, in, in articles around the time and, and even up to a year later, because after even, even six, 12 months after the June 1997 election, when the, that referendum 48, the decision to authorize the building of the new football stadium and, and authorizing demolition of the kingdom passed by uh, just a very narrow margin. Then there was created something called the Public, um, Public Stadium Authority. And it had meetings and it kept minutes of its meetings. And six months later, nine months later, in those minutes of those meetings, they were referring to the 72,000 seat National Football League requirement as though it was really a requirement. Although it had already been debunked more than a year later, they were, they were still playing this game. And again, Rick Anderson lays this out very nicely in his, in his article. 